Let me just tell you a little bit about myself and uh, maybe mention uh, why I decided to run and, and I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions that you may have. Now, I, I recognize a lot of faces in the audience, so you know I've, I've been in town for a long time and as you know I've done a lot of jobs here in town. I've been a uh, police officer, I've run the trauma center, a professor at the university, I teach and been here about 27 years now. And, um, I came actually recruited to start the first trauma system and I promised my wife I'd only stay two years. Uh, and we didn't even know where Tuxin was at the time. <laughs> but uh, I got a number of calls from a lot of people you know, uh, some at a local level, a lot of folks I know. Many of us who, many of the people that I uh, were called me were people that we would be commiserating with how bad government was and you know, gosh, we should do something about this and can't somebody make a decision. And, I was jumping in there like the rest of them saying, it is terrible, and let me tell you how bad it is because I've been there, you know, and, 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 and then people started, well, why don't you go back? Why don't you go run for office? I said, no, I, I've been there. That's why I don't want to go back. And, uh, you know, after the summer, I thought through it a lot. A lot of folks call me. Eventually, the calls came from friends, elected officials on both sides of the aisle, actually, uh, back in D.C. Uh, uh, the president called me, uh, Senate Majority Leader, Minority Leader, I talked to a number of people and I, I was very empowered because when they put the politics at the door, most of them said to me, you know, this is a unique opportunity, you should serve because it's very unusual to have somebody being recruited to be a U.S. Senator. And I had Republicans said that to me as well as Democrats. They said it's a matter of service. And, and these are friends of mine that I, because as Surgeon General, I work both sides of the aisle. I couldn't get my job done without working both sides of the aisle to move health policy. So. I gave it thought long and hard, and then of course I went to my commander in chief and asked for permission. And my wife said, "You want to do what?" <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I said, "Yeah, I think it's the right thing to do." And she struggled with it, but you know, she came around and she said to me, "You should do this. I mean, you're very fortunate to have gotten all you've done in life, and the family's willing to sacrifice, and you know, um, you should do this." And she was very supportive. Move to the front of this story now, so I've given it to you a little backwards. Just many of you maybe don't know my background, but you know, I, I, I never planned to do any of this. I come from a very poor Hispanic family. I was homeless as a kid. I was first born in this country. My, my parents are immigrants, and they spoke English as a second language. And uh, when I was six years old, we were homeless. And so the struggles of the regular person I understand firsthand because I lived the health disparities and not having access to care and all of that. But my savior was going in the army at 17 after I dropped out of high school and, you know, I never looked back and got a GED and lots of opportunity. So I got this kind of ethos, if you will, to always serve. I mean, I served at uh, local, state, national level and uh, I consider it a privilege to serve the people. So um, with that and because of that, uh, I decided to go give it a shot and um, I am I'm committed. Uh, to serve as your United States Senator, to serve you, to address your needs. I have a fairly good reputation in Washington because I did work both sides of the aisle for a long time and have friends on both sides of the aisle, and I understand how partisan things can be and how difficult they are. But on the other hand, my, my job is not to have an allegiance to a party or to any particular area. My allegiance is to stay focused on you because that's what I did as Surgeon General. As Surgeon General, I right away realized that my job was not to be the Surgeon General of the Republican or the Democratic Party. My job was to be the doctor of the nation and stay focused on what your needs are. And that many of you who fo followed the press, you know that uh, I took some heat for some of those things, you know, on, on very controversial issues. But I never st stood down because it was the right thing to do. Again, my job was not to placate either party and keep them happy. My job was to ensure that I was giving you all the best information and, su and supporting you the best I could as the doctor of the nation. And so now I get a chance to go back and do it again. And uh, I consider myself a pretty moderate, fair, centrist person. I listen a lot, but uh, I don't have any problem with making decisions once I've gotten all the facts. There's a lot of things that need to be done, not only in Washington, but at a local level. And certainly we know that there's been a, an absence of senatorial leadership south of our Mason-Dixon line for a long time, you know. And, and I think we deserve, we deserve more than that. You know, I've worked in your community, our community, for over a quarter of a century. I've worked the border for 25 years as a doctor, as a police officer, as Surgeon General. I know the culture, I know the language, I know the immigration issues, probably better than most. I teach policy at the university. 
you know. And so I think I bring a lot of things to the table, not as a politician, but just as a citizen who has had a lot of experiences at a local, state, and a national level. How, how would you, as someone who knows a lot about facts and things like how would you deal with the misinformation and or the information that just isn't real at all? Well, I think, you know, that has come to characterize politics in our country, that people just throw things out there, if nothing else, to slow you down and put you on the defensive. Negative things about you or just bad information. I think if you look at my track record as Surgeon General, when I had to deal with issues like stem cells, abortion, Plan B, weapons of mass destruction, terrorism, you never heard me waffle, you never heard me move left or right, I stayed focused specifically on what the needs of the people were, based on the best science. And that's what I'm going to do as Surgeon General and as a Senator. It's not going to change my approach because my values are my values. And I look at this as a privilege to serve my fellow citizens. And after all, I have to come back here and live here, okay? And I'm going to be here quite often, all right? And I think, you know, even after you're elected, I mean, some of our elected officials, you get elected, you never see them again, okay? And the fact is, my home is here. I never left. When I was Surgeon General, my home stayed in Tucson. Every chance I got, I came home. My first visit that I had a chance to take a trip from Washington, I, I bought a grant to Keno Hospital to be able to provide more services for underserved people. Okay, that was my first action as a Surgeon General, okay? So I didn't forget my community. A science teacher in Tucson says that belief is not a science word. Yep. You're entitled to your opinions, but not the fact, not your facts. You know, so. Yes, Hi, Dr. Carmona, we uh, would like to hear lots more from you about, specifically about some of the major issues in this country. And as a physician, I think one of the biggest one, the biggest threats to our health and, uh, and health of the environment and the health of the economy is climate change. So what do you propose to do about climate change? And, and as a part of that, would you discuss your views on a carbon tax? I'm oh, sorry. Carbon tax or a carbon okay. fee and dividend. Okay, yeah, yeah. that's that's. I could do a dissertation on this. I'm going to try and con you know <laughs> do it concise. Um, certainly, I had a lot of experience with, with this when I was in Washington, and I'll, I'll recount the meeting I went to to give you an idea. There, right outside the executive office building, there's a there's a row of um, um, townhouses that certain. Um, high-level people occupy, and there was an EPA office there that was the, the um, advisors to the president. So I was asked to come to a meeting where they were discussing global warming. And, and we, I remember sitting at the table, and everybody was going around, and I started listening to the discussion, which was really more political than science. You know, that, oh, this is a hoax, you know, it has this nothing, everything is fine. And I started thinking, this was like my first month or two as Surgeon General. And I started thinking, oh, I know why they invited me. They don't really understand. They would like me to explain this. <laughs> yeah, that's how naive I was. <laughs> so they said, I, I'm at the end of the table and say, well, Surgeon General, what do you think about global warming? I said, oh, well, look. I said, clearly, warming is going in the wrong direction. Our carbon footprint is not what it should be. There's many things we can do. And I think we can, we, there's no argument that man assist in moving that along. You can argue how much. I mean, if you look at the science, there's legitimate scientists who will say, no, it's not that much. But no scientists say there isn't any contribution by mankind. So even if it's only a little bit of contribution, I said, shouldn't we all endeavor to try and preserve the environment the best we can? And where we can recycle, where we can deal with waste, where we can reduce our carbon footprint, where we can protect our precious resources, shouldn't we be doing that anyway, even if it isn't the only cause? I was never invited back to one of those meetings. <laughs> I went once. I went once. I went once. You know, so I, I, I think this is an issue that it's very polar depending on which side of the aisle you sit on. But yet the science is, you know, pretty much in the middle there. It's clear that man does contribute. And there's many options. And certainly, you know, the carbon taxation issue and exchange issues and all of that. I think there's a number of remedies that, we, that can be put on the table, especially with the exchanges. But the most important thing is we have to raise the, the health literacy of all people to understand that we all have to take some personal responsibility. The remedy can't always be that we fund a federal program to undo all the bad things that we do. We all have to take some responsibility, just like we do for our health, to decrease the waste, decrease the carbon footprint. And I think the government's role should be to meet you there to be able to assist you, to educate you, and provide infrastructure to ensure that happens. Uh, as a
as a right. former Surgeon General and a current member of the College of Public Health, uh, what is your uh, opinion on universal health care? Well, if you're talking about, uh, let, me, let me break it into two pieces. I, I, my sense is every American should have access to a basic set of health benefits, period. Okay? The issue of universal, if you're talking about the business of medicine, now that becomes complex because if you're talking about a single payer source, it becomes very controversial. And as Surgeon General, it's an issue I dealt with. And you know, you can, you can fight battles in perpetuity in Washington, or you can find a seam that gets you place. Now, most of the time when I spoke to my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, I could get them to agree that aspirationally, it would be a good thing that we all endeavor to figure out a way to provide basic health care for all of our American citizens. Okay? The devil is in the details when you start to say, how do you do it? Who pays for it? Then it becomes very divisive. So I try and stay away from charged words like universal care, single payer, because they tend to stop the debate right away. Instead, I try and approach it as I did as Surgeon General to say, look, wouldn't you agree, even, even the most conservative people, wouldn't you agree that as citizens, as the richest nation in the world, we should not all aspire to figure out some plan that every citizen has access to health care? That opens the door. Then you start the discussion. The fact of the matter is, if you, if you reality, is it likely that we're going to have legislation that says, with any president, okay, or any Congress, I should say, because the president, as you notice, has limited authority, okay? And, and so, what solutions can we do incrementally to ensure that happens? If you go for it all and say, okay, I just want universal pay or universal health care, you know, it's a, it's a losing proposition. But if you say, let's just go by the premise that we want every American to do it, how can we have it? Can, and, and what's the payment system? How should it be? There's a whole host of options. For me, the goal is let's get to making sure that everybody gets access to health care, and then we can argue the nuts and bolts of who pays and how it's paid and what Medicare Medicaid should do. But I think the first thing on the agenda should be we all agree that we should be working together for a single value proposition, which is how do I provide the best care for the most people at the least cost? That's the value proposition we need to pursue, and it's one you've never heard from any of your elected officials as they fight over who pays. Yeah. Uh, Barbara, I'm sorry. Well, my question was also yes. about health care because um, the the new health care, affordable health care, mm -hmm. has the one part that's helpful to me because I have a son that has chronic health conditions yes. and the fact that they cannot deny him coverage. Right. But it looks like there's a big move to alter a lot of the parts of that health care. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How can you talk to your fellow senators and get them to see how important that is to keep some of those elements of that bill that was okay. good? So for, for those of you probably all aware, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, okay, called Obamacare, no. it's really a misnomer Don't because, say. you know, but it's, that's the, the right characterizes it that and then it becomes very much polar. The real issue is we have to get rid of the political dispassion and say, okay, we have this plan before us. What's good about this plan? Well, the first thing I think is good about it is that the fact is is that we have moved to try and accomplish that aspiration of making sure every American gets some form of health care. We have the age of dependence up to 26 now. So if you're a child, you know, child's in school, and like my kids, it took a long time to get out of college, you know, so you can, keep them, you can give them insurance for a little bit longer. Um, uh, that's good, the fact that everybody, but then when you start to get into the granularity of the system and you say, okay, so the, the idea is we're going to take, we have 50 million people that are uninsured, and that increases, of course, as our unemployment rate goes up. So now, the plan is in the next, uh, let's see, we're in 12, so the next two to three years, we're going to dump 32 million people into the healthcare system. Are there enough health professionals around to take care of 32 million new people? The answer is no. Okay. What about the money to care for, pay for those people? So aspirationally, I think it was right to do. The problem was, in my opinion, is there wasn't enough due diligence as to who are the providers, where will they be, how do these patients get distributed, who actually is going to pay for their care. So I think we have some work to do. 
your point is, a, is an important one, especially with somebody that's disabled, if your son mm -hmm. is disabled. But you know, a disabled person may have recourse through Social Security, through benefits through Social Security, as well as other special federal programs, as opposed to an average young man or woman who just is uninsured. But again, people come to say to me, well, Surgeon General, do you agree with Obamacare or the Patients Protection and Affordable Care Act? The press always likes to ask me that. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, which one of the 2,400 pages would you like me to comment on? <laughs> yes. it's, it's, it's a very complex document that has a lot of good things in it. But, you know, if, if you put the politics aside and look at it, there are things we could do better. But we all should line up behind the aspiration to ensure that every American has access to health care. Then we can debate how we do it. Well, I, I think uh, the DREAM Act should be part of comprehensive immigration reform. And I think for those youngsters who have been brought here of no fault of their own and have grown up and gone to school and passed their courses, and now they want to go to college, why should we deny them that? I mean, they've been acting as citizens and such. Now, on the other hand, uh, on the other hand, I would say I would hope that we could attach something to this uh, this obligation that we incur as citizens to have them complete their education. Uh, th this is a personal opinion. I think every young man and woman should do some kind of public service. Yeah. I don't mean military, but we're in the Peace Corps. Go on the Peace <coughs> Clinic. Go, go do something constructive for your community. So I would hope in return for, for granting the, these young people the education that we ask, just as I would ask any young person. So I did, and I'm not, I'm telling I, I did the same thing with my children. I told them, you need to do something for your community. Find something that you can do that you can bring added value. So I, I'm for the DREAM Act, but I, I don't want to deal with the DREAM Act as an isolated issue. I think it needs to be part of comprehensive immigration reform. Okay. Well, and that's the last question. Yeah. Um, Dr. Carmona, as you are, as everybody's very aware that in Arizona, there is a large segment of people who really don't like people who look who don't look like them, who might look like you, or who might look like me. <laughs> so I mean, my question is, have you, your wife, your family kind of thought about that and how you would deal with that issue? Well, I, um, I think part of it comes into the, you know, the thing that Ron Barber's uh, talking about, civility, not only in government, but just being respectful of your fellow man. You know, let me tell you a story. When I was in, uh, when I served in general, I did a lot of global traveling, and I got to see lots of different societies all over the world, see health ministers, presidents, and, and see how inextricably we are really tied to the rest of the world. Whether you're worried about emerging infections or terrorism, the borders, you know, these challenges that we face as a nation don't respect our geopolitical borders. You know, that's the fact. But I remember one day I was in a very remote part of the world, and I saw a bunch of little uh, Arab children in the desert, and they were huddled around a little black and white TV. And it was a TV that I think they had solar solar panel and it was wired. I don't know how they got it to work, but they were there. <laughs> and they were all, and I was like, what are they doing? You know what they were doing? They were watching Sesame Street in Arabic. Uh, okay? Now let me tell you, that changed the way I thought. I, I, I went back and I spoke to them and I made great friends with Sesame Street. I did a presentation one time at, a, at an international meeting, and I, it was on foreign policy. And I had uh, the head, an ambassador, and I had an admiral, and I had uh, people that had international experience, and I had the vice, senior vice president of Sesame Street. And everybody said, why is Sesame Street there? And I said, they all gave their pitches. So it was, you know, from USAID, Peace Corps, uh, the ambassadors, all of this, and then the admiral from the public health service. And then I had the guy from Sesame Street speak. And then when I said to the audience, I said, my contention is the greatest foreign policy export that this nation ever had is Sesame Street. You know why? It's been sustained for 40 years. It's translated into 110 languages and dialects. And what is the message, and no matter what language, peace, tolerance, health, 
So here's this group of kids that are poorly educated, huddled in the middle of nowhere, most of them malnourished, and what are they learning? Peace and tolerance. What turns it off as they see the world around them? So I think a lot of this has to do with us making sure we raise our children appropriately and make sure, you know, as Martin Luther King said, it's not the color of your skin, it's the quality of your character. Right? You know? And I think that's what we have to do. It's up to us as adults and citizens to promulgate that and not get bought into this vitriolic, you know, craziness that's taking over us now. We should be able to sit down and have civil discussions and, and, dis and, and always be respectful of others' opinions and then move forward. And that includes color of your skin. Because to me, it's a colorless world. I grew up in Harlem, in Washington Heights. There were only black and brown people there. They were all poor, okay? I mean, we, uh, we grew up at a time in the 50s and 60s. Parents weren't responsible for your extracurricular activity. I learned to swim in the Harlem River. I'm so healthy today because I've been exposed to every <laughs> <laughs> But growing up in that environment, where color doesn't mean anything, it's just, you know, it's, you, it's, it's the character. It's what you bring to the table to make the world a better place. And that's what I'm going to foster as a, as a senator. And, you know, civility, uh, tolerance of others, understanding. Uh, the world is a very unsafe place, but a lot of it is because of biases that are built in and prejudices and a lot of this uh, very divisive discourse that hurts us all. Well, um, that's it.